Amen. There we go. Get some power there. Amen. Well, it was great to see everybody here. Did you enjoy yesterday? Wasn't it so beautiful yesterday? That was spring. <laughs> it's, uh, it's long gone. So it's going to jump right into summer, I'm afraid. But it's great to have you here. Great to see some returning guests as well. It's always a blessing to have folks visiting with us. And uh, we look forward to a great day in the Lord's house. Nothing happens by accident. You and I are here on purpose. And so, once again, if you come ready to receive a gift from the Lord, I promise you, you'll walk out being blessed. Amen. I always try to tell people when I preach, I want one or two things that anybody could walk out and say, I'm going to work on those one or two things. So I ask you just to pray that way as we come to the Lord in worship. Let's go ahead and stand and have the worship team come up. One of my favorite songs. I love this song. It's actually the, the hymn uh, of this uh, is great. But they've kind of redone it a little bit and made it into the song Cornerstone. Think about the words as we sing these songs. And uh, let the Lord speak to your hearts. And I believe the message of the Word of God is the most important part of our service. But the songs prepare our hearts to receive the Word. So I encourage you, as we come in each time, don't just sit there and kind of hum your way through it. Think about the words. Say the words, even if you can't sing, can't carry a tune in the bucket. That's okay. People ask you to sing uh, on a hill far away. <laughs> uh, whatever the case may be, but think about the words as we sing this because the Lord, once again, is preparing our hearts so when the word of God is preached, we'll be ready. Amen. Let's go ahead and sing Cornerstone.
darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy
you're singing like you believe it today. Praise the Lord. Appreciate our worship team leading us in song. Uh, we're going to continue with the word of prayer here in just a, so, just a moment, but I want to mention a couple of different people. Continue to pray for Kathy, uh, Paul and Kathy, as they're still kind of going through some things. She's back home, but she's still struggling. She had those that maybe have been gone. Uh, she has some pain in her left arm. She did have a stroke a while back, so they took her back in, thought maybe she had a stroke, um, but she didn't. But she's at a point where can she go through open heart surgery or not? Are they going to treat it with medicines? So they're going to try to treat it with medicine first due to her other health risks. So I mentioned to them again that we would be praying for them this morning. And then uh, the nice wanderers, did they slip in at all? I think they're probably not here. Uh, they've been, I've been praying with them. They have a, uh, their daughter is, was pregnant and some complications were arising. Uh, but yesterday they had a healthy baby boy. And uh, so Logan, yeah, give him a round of applause. That's great. Hopefully they're watching online. We're happy for you. And um, if they aren't watching, I'll pretend that that applause was for me. So I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the Amersons as well, some of you know Dustin and Kayla Amerson. Uh, we've known them since we started the church. Dustin is a friend of mine. Um, but those who remember to keep her in your prayers, they had some kind of uh, negative reports uh, this week. And kind of uh, they kind of changed up her chemotherapy schedule and things. But uh, they're carrying kind of heavy burden uh, right now. And uh, if this doesn't work, then basically there's no, there's no hope for anything else, is that what Dustin said. So really, let's pray that in the next four or five months, they'll see progress. Uh, I believe we serve the great physician. Even if it's cancer, he can cure you if it's his will. So let me ask us to be praying for Dustin and Kayla today. And then once again, continue uh, to pray for our church family. I know we got some folks that are on the road today uh, and whatnot, but be praying for that. We're continuing to look for a new place of worship, or we stay right here where we're at. And I'll let you know in the next month here or so kind of what's decided. Um, but uh, I just encourage you to continue to pray. Uh, the Lord is not concerned. You can have a church without a building. Amen. You can. It doesn't matter. And we're not being pushed out of here, so we're not going. <laughs> we don't have to go anywhere. We're just looking for that next step where the Lord would have us go. So just continue to pray uh, in that regard. Pray for our president. Pray for our Congress. Pray for the judges as well that they would enact laws and have policies that would allow us to continue to serve faithfully and that we'd be able to continue to serve in peace. And so let's pray for our military personnel as well. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. Ask his blessing upon the service. Dear God, Lord, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that you grant to each of us at that moment of salvation. That glue, so to speak, that binds us all together to one heart. May we be like the early church that had one purpose, one accord, one mind. May we not be distracted by anything that's either gone on in our life today or are things that may take place from this point forward. Lord, may you allow our hearts to be open because of the message of song, but also, Lord, may our hearts be open because we are in your house today. Father, I do pray that you continue to watch over the Nicewanger family. We're thankful to hear that uh, both mother and child are, are safe and doing well. Continue to watch over them. Be with Kathy, Lord, as she's unable to be here with us again today. Watch over she and Paul, Lord. May you lift them up. Encourage them, Lord, in their walk with you. Lord, may you draw them close to your heart during this time. Lord, we do continue to pray for Kayla. Lord, you know what the end result is. You know what your perfect will is. And while we would not presuppose to tell you, Lord, what must be done. Lord, we do ask by faith, Lord, that you might heal her. Lord, she has some precious young ones that are dependent upon her. They have served you faithfully for so many years. Lord, I pray that you just be kind to them during this time. Remember, Lord, to encourage them and show your mercy and grace in their life. Father, I do pray for our president, pray for our Congress, judges, those that are making laws. We are commanded in your word to pray for them. They are not our enemy, Lord, but we want laws that will allow us to continue to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray that you would intercede in that behalf. Father, I do pray also, Lord, finally, that you would be with our military, those that are serving here and abroad. Keep them in your care. Thank you for the service that they provide for our nation. Father, may you... 
always let their families know that we are grateful as a nation for their sacrifice. Lord, as I said earlier, we are not here by accident. We are here on purpose. So, Lord, may you touch our hearts through the message of song, through the message of your word. Lord, may we be convicted. May we be enlightened. May we be encouraged. Whichever the case may be, may your Holy Spirit have free reign. In thy precious Son's name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and we'll continue on with our congregational singing. our next song, When We All Get to Heaven. We'll 
glad that you're going to heaven huh no matter what happens it's like the worst possible outcome in life is that we die but then we go straight to glory amen kids be dismissed those that are sixth grade and below you go to children's church appreciate the, those that are laboring in that ministry if you have your bibles you can turn to romans chapter one romans chapter one there was a farmer years ago that was having problems with some area hoodlums some kids, just kind of rambunctious kids, would get into his watermelon patch and get into his corn and get into all sorts of things. His watermelon patch seemed to be their favorite target because who doesn't like watermelon? And uh, he thought he'd get them to stop and think about what they're doing. And so he put a sign out, a big sign in the middle of the watermelon patch that said, one of these watermelon are poisoned. Sure enough, he came the next day. Every watermelon was right there, safe as could be, along with another sign that said, now there are two. <laughs> I want to speak this morning a message you may, those who have been saved for any amount of time have probably heard this message or somebody preached from this passage before. But Romans chapter 1 to be honest with you, I'm going to ask ourselves to ask a question today. Am I ready to be useful? Am I ready to be useful? God has a plan for each and every one of us. Thank you. God has a plan for each and every one of us. Even teenagers, believe it or not. Well, I'm, I'm short, so teenagers. God has a plan for your life, just for you. Away from your parents, away from, God has a plan for your life. Those that are elderly today, you know who you are, so I won't specify that. Wait, those elderly that are among us, that's me sometimes. Yeah, there we go, amen. God still has a plan for your life. No matter who we are, and no matter what our position or condition, he has a plan for your life. And can I, can I even say this? It's more than just sitting in a pew or a chair. He has people for you to minister to or to share the gospel with that may never darken the door of our church. You are their lighthouse. I am am their lighthouse and I show that light by what I say what I do and according to the gospel that should or could be given Paul says in Romans chapter 1 if you haven't figured this out yet this won't be a real funny message but it's one to be honest with you has been burning on my heart probably for two months and it's a precursor to our next series that we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks, we'll start that, entitled, Am I Truly a Christian? Am I Truly a Christian? The Bible talks about in the book of Acts that they were first called Christians at Antioch. Am I truly Christ-like? Am I truly a Christian? Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, the Bible says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and I love this next part because it includes me. And to the unwise. So as much as is in me is. I love that great English there. I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek played soccer for many years all the way through grade school junior high high school and into college soccer I would have to say probably is my sport if I were to choose one 
love soccer. I'm not ambidextrous with my arms, but I am ambidextrous with my feet. I can kick just as well with my left foot as I can my right foot, which is about 10 feet at this point in my life. But I, I, I taught myself to kick with both feet. And uh, I've also had the opportunity to coach my kids when they were growing up in their little soccer leagues that they have. I've also coached junior high and high school soccer. I've taught for a couple of years at a charter school, a high school charter school. Uh, I was able to coach there. But every once in a while when I was coaching a team and you'd have some guys that were very good and some guys that were just learning, is I would teach them the basics, right? Got to know the basics before you can truly play the sport. And there were times when we'd get a little loose and maybe we would lose a game because we were trying things or got, on, got in some bad habits. And you know the next thing I would do with the next practice we had? Those are in football or baseball. Or what does a coach, what should he do? He says, we're going to go back to the basics, the fundamentals of the game. Because the reason we're losing is we're not doing the simple things such as offense and defense as it's meant to be played. And I would say truthfully, those that are here, but those that are in other good churches that are meeting today throughout the Grand Rapids area, is not because we do not desire to be Christ-like. It is not because we don't desire to be used of God. But I think the reality is, is we fail to remember day in and day out that I am to be ready to be used by the Lord. And with that mindset in mind, that my life is what it should be so that before God and man, I can live righteously in a holy life, ready for God to use at any moment. Now, truthfully, I'll be honest with you, I'm not talking about this morning service. I'm talking about the times that we are away when we are on our own. Can the Lord just pick me up and use me? My kids were growing up. They had different chores I'd ask them to do. One of them, which they all loved, they all loved to do the dishes. I could tell when the boys did the dishes and when my daughter did the dishes. My daughter would do the dishes and everything was cleaned and wiped down and put away in its proper spot. When the boys did dishes, <laughs> you had to be careful which knife or fork you used. It was clean and in there, but it was not mom clean. It was boy clean. You'd pick up that knife and get ready to use it. What would happen? You're like, what is stuck to that? <laughs> Last week's Sunday dinner is still hanging around. Or you go to grab a cup and there were no cups. Either they were all dirty and in the sink, because the boys didn't do it, or they decided to play hide and go seek with the cups. Put them in different places. And if you're in a hurry, that's irritating. We need to be able to be used, but also to put ourselves in the capacity for the Lord to use us. But I do believe in this, and this is just all in the way of opening right now. I'm going to read a passage here in just a second, but we cannot allow the devil, Satan himself, the wicked one, or his minions to sidetrack our church or our families from our mission that God has us to do here. This church is important. Not, I don't believe we're more important than others, but this is our mission field. There are other churches that are good churches that are laboring with us in this mission field but this church is our focus. Lord, use us to be a light in this area. Lord, may that fire never be extinguished or sidelined. May we always be burning brightly for him. The devil loves nothing more than for a church to be sidetracked. Sometimes, even by good things, 
so as we don't get on to the best things. I'm going to read a little passage here of our church constitution, if you don't mind. Just so those that are visiting with us today or are new to our church, um, we, don't, we don't have this problem in our church. I'm just throwing this out so that we understand. Four and a half years ago when we started Cross Point Baptist Church, we wrote some of these things, and I believe them in my heart still today. It says that this in our Constitution, the purpose and mission of this church shall be to strive by the help of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ as stated in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and throughout the New Testament by stating this, every member or attendee shall be urged and expected to personally, personally take the gospel of salvation to the lost and to support the propagation of the gospel through home missions and foreign missions. You know what that's saying? We all ought to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just attend a church who is evangelistic. We must be evangelistic. It's part of God's plan, and it's in his word. And it's what Cross Point is all about. It's not so we can have multiple ministries or multiple activities, but everything must be surrounded and melted into the idea that we are equipping the saints to go out individually and collectively to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. New converts, those that accept Christ, shall be instructed and taught in manners of baptism, Bible study, prayer, church attendance, personal soul winning, tithes, offerings, and Christian conduct. Then number three, to provide fellowship for Christians on a biblical foundation. We need to realize that there are others that love the Lord Jesus Christ like we do and to come together collectively to carry out that great commission. Now, once again, we don't have a problem with this. What I'm doing simply is this. Those that have followed where we've been since January, of course, I was away for three months. I had uh, vocal cord dysfunction, which I'm hearing it right now is starting to kick up. So if I stop, it's not a long 30-second dramatic pause. It's the Holy Spirit's way of telling me to shut up for a little bit. To be quiet. I'm sorry. To be quiet for a little bit. There's not an issue with this. But I want to make sure that as we're moving forward as a church, that we remember what our purpose is. We remember what our purpose is. There have been good churches that got sidetracked because they got off the right pur purpose. And they begin to focus upon all the bells and whistles that they have without realizing that those things aren't essential to its purpose. We must stay focused on that. It goes on to say, and then we'll get into our message here, that we further agree to maintain family and private devotions, time with God, to live a consistent Christian testimony in the world. And notice this next part. To avoid all tattling, backbiting, or excessive anger. To abstain, that means to keep from things that will cause our brethren to stumble or that will bring reproach on the name of our Lord and Savior. I love the sweet spirit that our church has. I love that we come in and we greet one another and we're happy to see one another and that we sing out and we open our hearts to the Word of God. But once again, if we're not careful, we can get bogged down in your normal church minutia. The normal things that a church does. And before long, we're spending more of our time biting and snapping at each other, and that takes our mind off of what our purpose is for. 
me state two things very clearly. This church isn't for everyone. I'm not saying, no, everyone's not welcome. You are. But I'm not saying we're the only church and somehow everyone that walks in is automatically going to become part of our church. Maybe God has those people to serve somewhere else. I don't know. We leave that to the Lord to, to sort out. But the worst thing that we can do is to focus on things that are, do have no real eternal value and that become the purpose of our church. Let me give you an illustration of this. Last week, we had pancakes. I like pancakes. Some of you didn't, so you had fruit. That's okay. I like fruit, too. Not vegetables, but fruit. Fruit, I could say, is biblical. Vegetables may be a sin. I'm not certain. The deeper Greek, I think there's something there. I haven't found it yet. But do we have pancake breakfast just so we can eat? Yes, I did. No. Actually, no. You got the right answer. No, we don't. So why do we have that? For fellowship, right? But also to bring people into the house of God so they can hear the gospel, right? If we're not careful, we get sidetracked. It's like three-card Monty, right? <laughs> which, which one is it? If we're not careful, we choose the things that may look good, but it's not essential to our purpose. That was all introduction. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. This is the other second part of the introduction. <laughs> Neh Nehemiah chapter 6, where Nehemiah is building the wall with the people. And there were a couple evil men by the name of Samballot and Tobiah and Geshem that were trying to get them to stop building the wall. And they finally came to him, instead of laughing at him, they came to him to say, come down to a meeting. He said, come, let us meet together in some one of the villages on the plain of Ono. That should be the answer right there, Ono. Nehemiah writes, but they thought to do me mischief. See, what is he saying? They thought to either kidnap him or kill him. He says, so I sent messengers unto them saying, I love this part. I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? What was Nehemiah saying? This wall needs to be built. God has called me to this part of, of building this wall, and I don't have time to be distracted by flies. I don't have time to be distracted by people having conversations that aren't a part of the work of this, of this wall or have no desire to see it built. Said <laughs> it sent after me, unto me, four times after this sort. And I answered them after the same manner. Four times they came and said, let's meet. Nehemiah said, I'm too busy to meet with you. Once again, what was his purpose? He said, I have to build the wall, and nothing is more important than that. Because that is what God has called me to do. So when it comes to church or ministries... Every church ministry, whether it's a small group, whether it's a Wednesday night class, whether it's an Awana program, whether it's a Teen Ignite, no matter what it is, it's always with the mentality of reaching the lost with the gospel or preparing us through fellowship that we are not alone, that we might sharpen one another in our testimony to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, once again, that is our purpose. We can collectively say that is what our church is about. But can I also draw it one step further, which is more important, and that is this. That is your personal responsibility. My personal responsibility. I believe God wants his church house to be filled. I do. I believe that. You can amen that because you're here. <laughs> I believe God wants more people, the Lord wants more people to hear the gospel. 
He wants more people to know of his saving grace and the great love that he has for everyone, no matter where they are, where they come from, what their childhood background was, how much money they make or don't make, no matter what their health condition, he wants them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that while they can't get to heaven because of their sin, Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, and if they will trust him as their Savior, they too can go to heaven when they die. Amen. That is our individual Christian purpose. I want to look at three things here. We may not get to all three, and if we don't, we'll pick it up next week. How about that? Every time you look at your watch, it adds five minutes, so don't, don't go there. <laughs> Number one, if you have your bulletin, you can flip it over in the back, and there's a worksheet you can look at if you'd like. Number one, Paul says, I'm a debtor. I am a debtor. Verse number 14, says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor. Well, first of all, Paul says, yes, I'm a debtor to the Lord. I'm a debtor to the Lord first. You see, what is he trying to say? What Paul is trying to say is, he, the Lord, deserves my life. Can you guarantee me that you'll be alive tomorrow? Now, the law of averages might be in your favor, right? So what do you mean? You probably will wake up in the morning. But you can't guarantee that. I remember probably oh, about 14 years ago, my wife and I, I love my wife. She's my best friend, stronger Christian than I could ever hope to be. I met at college, and the greatest thing I ever did was marry her. I married up. But my wife got into watching these shows, you know, 48 hours or whatever else, you know, where they, in a matter of an hour and a half, solve the mystery you know the husband killed the wife the wife killed the husband kind of thing you know what i'm talking about she got into those it made me nervous <laughs> she kept watching these and until she started taking notes john i was like wait a minute <laughs> hold, on, hold on a second i woke up one morning she was measuring my feet <laughs> had bought two big bags of concrete and i was like Joe, something's wrong. <laughs> but you and I can't guarantee that we're going to be alive tomorrow. There's no guarantee of that. James says what? It's, you're, it's like a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanishes away. Acts chapter 9, verse number 15. The Bible says this, but the Lord said unto him, this is during the conversion of the Apostle Paul, who was called Saul at this point, if you recall his road to Damascus experience where the light came down from heaven and Jesus spoke to him and knocked him off the donkey, and for three days he was blind. God laid on the heart of a man by the name of Ananias to go and to heal him of his eyesight. But Saul was an enemy to Christianity, and of course that made Ananias just a little nervous. This guy would grab him and throw him in prison. This is what the Lord says to Ananias when Ananias said, I don't know if I want to go see this man Saul. The Lord said unto him, Ananias, go thy way, for he is a what? Chosen vessel unto me. What is he saying? His life has a purpose. I have plans, great plans for him. But it requires you, Ananias, to do your part. See what he's saying? Sometimes it may not be about us being this great witness or great teacher, but maybe that person is out there and just needs to hear the truth. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. For what? To have small group study. 
to organize teen activities, huh? to go to men's and women's conferences. No. He says, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Once again, the things I mentioned aren't wrong, but we need to make sure the primary is still the primary. He deserves my life. Has God been good to you? Amen. So then he deserves my time as well. See, if I don't realize that he, I owe everything I have to the Lord Jesus Christ and that he is in control of every part of my being, my possessions, my goals, he's in charge of everything. If I fail to understand that, I will never get to the second part where I, should, I give him my time. Pastor, I'm too busy for Bible study. Pastor, I'm too busy to come to church. I'm too busy. Wait a minute. When we're too busy for the Lord's work, we're too busy. Got to be careful. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through, or 11 through 14. Please turn your Bibles. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. The Bible says this, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. Say, why? You're going to start snoring during the service, so wake up. <laughs> There's one old pastor that was preaching. He saw a kid in the back sleep, and he yelled to the kid next to him. He said, hey, wake that boy up. The other kid shouted. He goes, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> Two guys were coming home from the service that was extra long. And as he was going out, he shook hands with one of the deacons and said, man, with our pastor, you don't need a watch. You need a calendar. Like, what? Never mind. He deserves my time. Awake out of sleep. Why? For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. What's he saying? He said all those other things that the church can become about. What most people outside the church think that every church is like. Bunch of squabbling over casserole dishes and Nobody shook my hand, all these kind of things. It really don't matter. What does he say in verse 14? But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You say, what's he saying there? He's saying, make not provision. Don't give the space in your heart to get your feelings hurt and get off purpose. Stay on point is what Paul is saying. Why? Because the day is spent. The night is at hand. What night? As Jesus said, the night cometh when no man can work. I believe we're living in the last days. Amen. I do. Our churches, we don't talk a lot about that anymore. We're so busy talking about being a good friend. Huh? How to time manage. Huh? But we're living in the end days. And look around you. Huh? If you notice what's happening in Russia and China, he said it's coming. Huh? It's a lot of things where I believe that now is the time. I hope Jesus comes before tomorrow. Amen? Because I think I owe the, the IRS. So I'm hoping that I can slide on that one. Yeah. Or. If it's not that, maybe the Lord will send me a check. <laughs> I don't know. I think the Lord's coming again. See all the wars in this world right now? Hmm? Famine? Pestilence? We just went through two years of pestilence. I'm talking about other things, right? New variants. As if the flu isn't enough. Christians asleep at the wheel. The Bible talks about that too. Huh? Marrying and giving in marriage, Jesus talked about it. Huh? 
Just like in the days of Noah that everybody just thought they had all the time in the world until the rain fell. Then I bet you everybody wanted to be on the boat. Christian, we need to wake up. Our churches need to wake up. We need to remember our purpose. Because it doesn't matter how many basketball leagues we have or volleyball leagues or softball teams if people around us are dying and going to hell. If they are lost without Jesus Christ, the days are short for them to hear the truth. This is once again where I say this church and others like it are essential today. But individually, it is essential that we as Christians wake up before, yes, the Lord comes again and we're gone. Amen? Amen. But what about our neighbors that we never talk to about salvation? What about our coworkers that we worked alongside for 20 years and never really invited them to church or thought to think about giving them a track and asking them, do they know Jesus Christ? Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Paul realizes he's a debtor not just to the Lord, but to all of mankind. Seneca, the great Roman philosopher at the time of Christ, said this about time. He says, we are always complaining that our days are few, and yet acting as though there would be no end. That is pretty profound. But he says, I'm a debtor not just to Christ for what he's done for me. But in particular, he says, I'm a debtor to mankind. I'm a debtor to mankind. Now, what is it that he mentions here? He says, well, first of all, to the Jews. And you'll see this throughout the New Testament. That he mentions the Jew first. Now, why is that? Because the Jews, for thousands of years, have had the truth sitting in their lap. Huh? They had the Mosaic Law. They had the offerings and the symbolism to point to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they failed to hear the truth of the message, right? So the Lord said, instead of telling the Jews only, now we're going to share it with the entire world. Now, the Jews are still God's chosen people. I'm talking about today. That never has changed. They're still his chosen people. You say, what about the church? No, the church is his bride. The church and Israel are not synonymous. It's a different message for a different time. But he always says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see it repeatedly over in the New Testament. Turn over to Romans chapter 9, please. This is Paul's heart. When he speaks here, he says, I say the truth in Christ and lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. What's he saying? He's saying, I am asking God to be my witness that what I'm telling you is the absolute truth. In the depths of my heart, what motivates me, what causes me to act, what compels me to move forward, to share the gospel of Christ with the Jews. He says, God is going to be my witness here through the Holy Ghost that lives inside of me, that I have great heaviness and, what's he say also, continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are who? Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. What is Paul trying to drive home here? He says, yes, I am sent as a missionary to the Gentiles. That's God's plan for Paul's life. But Paul says, I was a Jew from my, children, my, my childhood on up. And I'm always burdened for those that have the truth of Jesus Christ through the Pentateuch, through the Mosaic Law, through the prophets, but yet still have not come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, if you back up, back up two verses here. 
He said, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Keep going there. For I wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren and my kinsmen according to the flesh. You say, what is he saying? This is really profound, so don't miss this. What he's saying is this. I want the Jews, my brothers, my sisters, according to faith. To receive Christ, that I would be willing, if God would permit it, to suffer in my sins and to suffer hell for them. If they could take my place. That's, that's strong stuff. I'll be honest with that. Look at that and say, I don't know if I could be willing to say that, but I should be. I love this country. Don't you love this country? I do. I love being a U.S. citizen. If you've ever lived outside of the United States, you'll know why it's so essential, why it's the most beautiful spot in the world for most in third world countries. But it burdens and saddens my heart when I see how many murders have been committed in our big, our big cities right now. How it's unsafe to go into major cities and to bring the gospel because you don't know if you're going to come back out alive here in the United States. I'm saddened because of the murder through abortion, the genocide of the innocents. You say, that's political. No, that's scriptural. Life begins at conception. If someone has had an abortion, it's just like any other sin. God can forgive you. And I will not judge you any more than that because we're all condemned in our sins. We're all sinners saved by grace. But the millions of innocents that have lost their life since 1973 should break our hearts. The direction of the United States of America burdens me greatly. What nation am I leaving for my children and my grandchildren? Huh? There are only two genders. So how can you prove that? I'm not a biologist, but I am a biblicist. And the Lord said, male and female created he them. You say, what if they don't identify as that? What if they want to identify as a girl when they're really a guy? That's a mental disorder. It is a product of sin in our society and will be the downfall of many a nation. You say, what does it matter to me? It doesn't. We ought to love them all the same. They don't need to be screamed at. They need to be loved. But once again, we've got to become part of this discussion. But in this, I'm burdened for the United States. I love this country. I love its citizens. I love everything that it affords. Can I be like Paul and say, if it meant me taking their place, I would be willing to do that? Now, once again, I'm not... I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching with you. Because I don't think any of us are at that peak. But this is why Paul said, I'm ready to die for Christ. I'm willing to be stoned by my people, the Jews. I'm willing to be beaten by the Jews. I'm willing to be torn apart by the Jews if it meant them hearing the truth of Jesus Christ. Because that's my purpose. I'm a debtor. To the Lord first and foremost, and to all of mankind. I'm going to stop there for right now. All God's people said. <laughs> we'll pick it up next week. If the Lord comes again like I'm praying, he comes again before tomorrow, 
We won't have to go to the second part. Another nice way of looking at it. I want to ask you to do something this week, though. Every day, every day, evaluate your time and your priorities. You see, being a debtor changes your outlook and your direction. We are not an island unto ourselves. We have a divine purpose in our community. Sadly, many churches are changing and going along with all this craziness. I saw the other day where there was a church, I won't say where it was from, it's in the news, where the pastor dressed up in drag and held a Bible study. Our mainline denominations, Baptists as well as others, I don't think I'm just picking on somebody else, Baptists as well, we're forgetting our purpose. Let me encourage us this week, evaluate our time, our schedules, but then pray with me this week and say, Lord, am I ready to be used? Am I of the right mindset to be able to be used of God whenever the Lord is ready to put me in? I don't have to get prepared. I am prepared. It starts here. This is what Paul's talking about. It starts here. A mindset. So let me encourage us as a church to think about that. Okay? We'll get to the next of it next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for our church. I thank you for its people, Lord. I know this message is probably different than others may have heard. And I do not believe I can even give it the justice it deserves. But, Lord, may we as a church pray diligently for our nation, pray for our community, and most importantly, to pray that we would have utterance, opportunities to speak to people about Jesus Christ. You are the way, the truth, and the life. May we evaluate our lives, and may we pray for our churches this week. Your head's bowed and your eyes closed. I want to ask you two simple questions. I wonder this morning, would you say, Pastor, I'm a debtor to the Lord Jesus Christ because I have received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know that I'm a Christian. There's been a time in my life when I received Christ as Savior. Would you slip your hand up and let me praise the Lord for you? Amen. Hands all over the room. Praise God. I am a Christian. You may put your hands down. I know that I'm a Christian. Maybe you could not raise your hand. Maybe you say, I don't know that for certain. The good news news is today you can receive Christ as Savior. Right there in your seat, you can say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I need you. Say, Pastor, I've got too many sins in my life. I've got too many problems. No, no, come to him as you are and let the Holy Spirit change you from the inside out. Say, I'd like to do that, Pastor. We pray a simple prayer very simple prayer. The prayer doesn't save you. It's a belief in your heart that saves you. But to simply say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm bound for hell because of my sins. But I also know that you came and died upon the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again to give me salvation. I ask you now to come into my heart and my life and to be my Savior. I trust in you and you alone for my salvation. If you're here this morning, you say, I prayed that prayer this morning, Pastor. In this service or online, I prayed that prayer. Would you slip up your hand so I can pray for you? I'll not draw attention to you. Amen. Anyone else? Just slip your hand up. Slip it back down receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. The second question, Christian, will you covenant to pray with me for our church and for our community that we are the lighthouse that He expects for us to be? 
How many this morning would just simply say, Pastor, this week I covenant to pray with you every day together as a church for our community and for our church. Would you slip your hand up and pray? I just want to praise the Lord for you. Lord, you see our hands, Lord. You know our hearts. This is something we are dedicating to you and to you alone, Lord. So, Lord, I do pray that you would help us this week through prayer to gain a greater burden for the lost in our community and the need for salvation. We don't save anyone, so we need your Holy Spirit to go ahead of us and to share that gospel. Thank you, dear Lord, for Cross Point Baptist Church. Thank you for those that are here. Lord, may they know my heart, and more importantly, may we know the truth of the Word of God. That we are in the last days, and we need to do everything we can to share the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. In thy precious Son's name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Have the kids make their way in. Give me just a second. It's a little sorry. Just give me just a second here. They say when I do this, I'm supposed to speak quietly or <laughs> not at all. I'm like, obviously, you don't know me. I laughed when the doctor told me that. He said, You could do exercises. I have certain exercises. I have to do not, not like physical exercise, like voice exercise. I'm supposed to go, um. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sounds like Ben Hur when they're beating the drum, you know. We keep you alive to row this ship. Row well and live. <laughs> I have these exercises when that happens. Other when my vocal cords close up and I have a tough time breathing. So thank you for being patient with me this morning. One of the most important parts of the church service is the taking of offering. We're commanded to do that. You know that? First Corinthians chapter 15 says, or 16 says that we're to give our offering the first day of the week. We're supposed to do that. We're supposed to collect offerings first day of the week. Do you know that the offering, but money in particular, is all tainted? Taint yours and it's taint mine. It's the Lord's. Uh, at this church, I want you to give as unto the Lord. Give from your heart. And uh, once again, we don't do raffles and other things. Lights stay on. Tracks go out. Ministries continue because of the faithfulness of God's people. Please encourage you to give from your heart. And let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I don't look at tithing statements. I never have. I don't care what anybody gives. I want to be able to get up here and preach like I did this morning and not worry about offending anybody. I better get upset and walk out and there goes our money. I don't care about that. It's the Lord's money. Huh? doesn't matter. Let me encourage you. You give from as God directs you, and however he tells you to give, I'm happy with it, contented. Brother Steve Sonnen, would you please turn and give your voice and pray for the offering? Amen. Well, as they're doing that, we're going to take a look at some upcoming things that we have going on as a church. Uh, pray for me uh, this afternoon. Uh, I do a once a month. I go over and have service at uh, Sunset Manor over in, on Baldwin there in Jenison. Uh, my wife and I will be there. Um, they are opening up slowly for other people to come in. Our goal is always to have church people come with us and be a, mission, um, a minister to the people that are there. Uh, because of COVID, they're still... Uh, very particular about how many people can come. I'm waiting for that to open up so we can get back going over to the Home for Veterans. We go over there once a quarter and have a service with them. Uh, there's a lot of things like that that we are not able to do now that we could two years ago. So uh, just be praying that that would open up once again. But my wife and I will be there today at 2 o'clock. If you have time, just think of it and pray for us uh, that the Lord would guide us. 
Uh, and then uh, this coming Wednesday, we do have a missions committee meeting. Those who are involved in the missions committee, make sure you be here at the church at 6 p.m. before the service. And then there's a number of other things that are on here uh, that I ask for you to think about as well. Uh, in particular, the ladies' Bible study uh, that we uh, have every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, if you have the second Tuesday of every month. Second, I'm sorry. Second, I was thought they were workaholics. I didn't do it every t every Tuesday, but now uh, second Tuesday. If you uh, would like to have more information about that, you can see Holly and who else is in part of that? Just you right now, and Chastity. Okay, uh, <laughs> Chastity wasn't paying attention. She goes, "What I do?" Uh, um, now talk to those ladies, and they will they'll give you more information on that. I encourage the ladies to come and be a part of that uh, Bible study, and then. Um, uh, we do have our business meeting we're going to do on a Wednesday this time, uh, on the 11th. And if you'd like to come and be a part of that, uh, it's open to everybody, but only members are allowed to vote and basically ask questions that are there. But we don't have any secrets as a church. You can come feel free. Our business meetings are so exciting. So we look over financials, man. I just, the night before, I'm just going to hardly wait, man, for <laughs> business meeting to come. Uh, but uh, Lord's blessed us here. He really has. Have good finances here at our church. Things are in order. God has been good to us, really has. So, uh, but I need to make mention of that we did, we canceled it in January because of my health. I wasn't able to be here, so now we're having that business meeting uh, now on the 11th. Uh, one other thing I just want to mention, and the worship team make their way on up, and we'll close the service. Is every Wednesday we do have Bible study, and I want to mention this because we don't always mention up here things, but um, the Bible study that we have um, is for everybody. And uh, Brother Jamie teaches a really good class in here. He's going through um, one of the books that we do for the addictions program. Uh, are you in Nevertheless, Nevertheless I Live? Uh, they're going through that. And then they do have a Sunday morning 915 Bible study that they do uh, called The Tall Law. I think you're still in Tall Law, which are both basically just really intense discipleship. You get to know your, your makeup and what God's plans are for you and how the Lord sees us. And one of the unique things about our addictions ministry is I don't believe that you're an, you're an alcoholic for the rest of your life. I don't believe that you should be beaten down and drag your chin on the ground and you're less than an individual because you have a drug addiction. I believe that through the Lord Jesus Christ, primarily through salvation and then through his power, you can be victorious and stop being an alcoholic. Amen. I believe that's capable. I've seen it happen many, many times. So that's what makes our ministry unique in that sense. Brother Jamie does a great job of speaking, and I enjoy listening to him on Wednesdays. I'm not doing my class right now uh, because I'm still kind of waiting for this to kind of go away. Middle of May, uh, we'll start doing my Bible study. Again, we're going verse by verse through the book of First Thessalonians. So it's a small group every week Bible study that we do. Uh, that'll start here in just a couple weeks, probably after Mother's Day. Uh, we'll start that back up. Um, usually, yeah, I'm going to have if you usually fill my office, but I uh, encourage you to come make that a part of your week. Uh, it's kind of just that we, they, the world calls it the hump day, right? Right in the middle. Uh, we need that, once again, to get our batteries charged many times. So come to either one of the classes. I'm sure there'll be a blessing to you. During that time, the teens meet. Mufasa here is the one that said charge. Ahmed. Uh, Pastor T is my son. Those that don't know who he is. Uh, he's, uh, we're co-pastoring together. But he teaches the teens every Wednesday night. Does a fantastic job with our teens. A good group of young people that are coming. Smart teens. None of them are here today, but... We, we, <laughs> no, sorry, I saw Caleb and threw me, buddy. Uh, but they have a good time back there. So I encourage you, you have a teenager, bring them, bring them on Wednesday night. It's an important part. They always get taught the Word of God. That's something that's unique in every ministry that we do here. The Word of God is preeminent. And so let me encourage you to make that a part of your week. If you have a teenager or kids, sixth grade and below, we have an Awana program. Brother Rich, you're going to wave your hand, Brother Rich there. He's in charge of our Awana group, and I really appreciate he and the other people that are there and uh, the job that they do. Sometimes it's like herding cats. <laughs> huh? I, was saying, I watch him back there. I'm like, he's herding cats again, man. They're all over the place. He's like trying to get them where they're supposed to go, but he and the other workers do a great job of that. So pray for them. And we also have a nursery. So why do you mention all that, Pastor? Because there's no excuse not to come then. No matter how old you are or who you are. I uh, plan to come make it that Wednesday night. We have such a great time. The majority of our church people show up on Wednesday night again. I love that. So 
Come be a part of it, and you'll, I'm sure it'll be a blessing to you. Let's all go ahead and stand. I want to welcome some of you to our services that just woke up. <laughs> glad, glad you could be here and show up with us today. And uh, we're going to start our service by... No, I'm just... <laughs> send them into panic mode. I love pastoring this church. This is the most fun I've ever had in 30 years of ministry. I love pastoring this group of people. We have a good church. And uh, I'm thankful for you. I love being your pastor. If I could do anything to help you, encourage you, make sure you tell me that. If you have a sickness or illness, you want me to pray for something for you, let me know. I'm not clairvoyant. Okay, see what I mean? I can't read minds. Okay, you got to just share it with me, and I'll, I'll do what I can to help or pray. Um, but also, I'm encouraged if you don't have a church home, this is a good place. I'd encourage you once again to do that. If you'd like for my wife and I to come visit, uh, feel free to kind of mention that to me. I'll be in the back here shaking hands. We'd love to come by and have a visit with you and uh, to share what God has done for us here, but also how it can affect and influence your life. We're an open book at this church. Ask me any question you want. I don't always have the answers. So I would say dumb looks are always free. So I just told you this puzzle expression. It's okay. Uh, I'll try to find out the answers. Once again, thank you for coming this morning. Make every Sunday morning a, a part of your schedule, whether it's here or if you're traveling in your home church, make sure you're, you're in the Lord's house and you're growing. I love you folks. I really do. Worship team, close us up. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed.